Um, I'm very excited to be able to introduce Kelly DeCosta um, to you, who's um, going to talk to you about viruses and antibodies and so on. Over to you. Okay, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Hopefully, I'm going to do something a little bit different to what Katie did, but kind of build on the ideas that she put out there for you. So, I'm fortunate enough to um, have joined the lab of Nigel Templeton as part of the virus serotyping unit um, at the Midway School of Pharmacy, which is the University of Greenwich and Kent working together to create new pharmacists. So, why are we doing do virology there? Good question. Um, but it seems like a nice home for us and we, we feel quite well with everybody. Okay, so I've just had lunch so I'm tired, so I'm going to ask you, what do you know about antibodies? Anybody, anything? They're specific to antigens. Perfect. Anyone else? That's all we know. Yeah? Okay. What about the different types of antibodies? Have you heard of some of these? Yeah? IgG, IgA, yeah, IgM, maybe. So um, the one that kind of we're most obsessed with at the moment is IgG, but I wanted to highlight that IgA is quite important because we often find it at mucosal surfaces, which is where a lot of nasty viruses get in, like coronavirus, of course. Um, so you may be familiar with the term monoclonal antibody and polyclonal antibody. Sound familiar? Maybe. Okay, so our monoclonal antibodies, we basically make ourselves. So Katie spoke to you this morning about how we do a B cell sort and we find, we kind of try and work backwards from what we find works from the B cells and the antibodies they produce to try and produce vaccines. Um, but just naturally in our bodies and in the bodies of other animals, we will produce lots and lots of antibodies. Okay, so this is something I started thinking about when I first did my PhD, and it's kind of been a theme, um, my first postdoc, and now again here, is that antibodies, we often just talk about the neutralising antibodies and the effects that they have. So you'd have had with coronavirus that we then look at people's antibody responses and we look for binding antibodies maybe, but usually neutralising antibodies is a goal. Yeah. Now, I did my PhD on um, HIV, so some of the examples are quite HIV specific on this, this slide, but... Basically, antibodies are quite diverse and do quite a lot of different functions. They can target different things. So when we think of um, viruses, we tend to think of neutralising viruses, which stop entry into our cells, which was what Katie Dawes was talking about. But they also do lots of other things. Um, so there's two regions to an antibody, as I've shown you on the slide, and one side can actually interact with other cells in the immune system. So it's not just like a one-trick thing. Okay. So I'm going to give Influenza as my example of what we do at the BPU and how we're using the tools that we've created there to explore viruses and antibody interactions. So you've all heard of Influenza, I think we touched on a bit this morning as well. Um, it's an enveloped virus, which means that we do have this envelope around the edge which expresses glycoproteins for us. Just to mention that we do have four um, subtypes of Influenza, A, B, C and D. A and B being the main ones that infect humans, although C does infect us as well, although it tends to be paediatric infections, and you don't tend to hear as much about it. Influenza D was only discovered in 2011 and has mostly been described in farm animals. So let's focus on A and B for the minute. So if we look on the surface of influenza, we find two main proteins on influenza A and B. We have the HA or hemagglutinin trimer, um, which is involved with entry and therefore the target of most of our neutralising antibodies. And we also have neuraminidase, which is actually an enzyme that catalyzes a reaction that's required for fusion and ingress. So, influenza A has 18 individual subtypes that are based on HA. Um, and these coexist with 11 different NA subtypes. Now, in nature, we tend to look at avian influenza, as this tends to be the one that infects humans most. Um, it's H1 to H16. H17 and H18 being found only in bats, and these have only recently been described. Um, and actually, the HA and NA have slightly different functions, so I'm going to steer away from them a little bit in this talk. Um, so we know that we can infect humans and animals. So why is this really bad? Because what we find is not only is there a chance that a human might be infected by um, a, by, an, a, by a poultry, uh, so chickens, by, poultry, by chickens or by pig that might have 
um, strain that we've seen before, but they might also have nasty things like H5, which can be quite dangerous. But what we don't see a lot is that these different strains pass between humans very well. So something needs to happen to enable them to jump species. And the big problem we have is that pigs are considered like a melting pot for um, influenza. Influenza loves swapping genes. And when it gets together in pigs, pigs can be infected with influenza that has come into contact with wild birds, perhaps the chickens that you have around. Um, and then obviously we come into contact with far farm animals and this can um, enable the pig to have a humanised virus and an avian influenza virus and then we have a melting pot for a pandemic. Um, influenza B is a little bit different in that the main reservoir is us. So this is mainly a human uh, virus, though it has actually been found in bizarrely seals um, and a few other marine mammals. Um, this also has HNNA, the same as influenza A. We did have two lineages, but one disappeared during COVID. No one's 100% sure why, and um, that particular one didn't circulate anymore. Again, this can cause seasonal disease, and it's included in our vaccines. So it just shows you that it is still circulating. Is there pandemic potential? Who knows? Okay, so in the past, we've been talking a lot about the coronavirus pandemic, but it's not the first pandemic, probably won't be the last. So 1918, Spanish influenza, suddenly everyone knows about that because we compared coronavirus to it. Um, so we have an H1N1 virus here. And then in 1957, an H2N2 virus caused um, an, what they call, termed Asian flu. Um, and this caused another pandemic. Um, and then in 1968, we had an H3N1 pandemic um, that was called the Hong Kong flu. And you may remember swine flu in 2009. Well, I'm just really old. Um, but the interesting thing was, in 1977, this was sometimes called the Russian flu, and there was an H1N1 reappeared in humans. So it disappeared around the time the H2N2 came. This then knocked H2N2 out. So now, only people that were alive a long time ago have um, any kind of protection naturally from it. And remember, with influenza, you're not just going to come into contact with this virus once. You're going to get it repeatedly over your life, different strains, different subtypes. They're always going to be slightly different because influenza likes to change its genes in a process we call antigenic drift. So it kind of drifts along, making slight changes, which is why the vaccines change slightly year on year. So traditionally, how do we measure responses to influenza? We look at the hemagglutinin. So we have, you may have seen this in your classes, the hemagglutination assay. So basically, if you have just red blood cells, they like to fall to the bottom of your plate. If you have a virus, um, which obviously has to be an influenza virus, it will he cause hemagglutination, so it will make the heme groups come together, and you'll get this kind of fuzzy circle. But if we have an antibody that prevents that process from happening because it's binding to the HA, we get, once again, the same as if we don't have the virus there. And that is how we select our influenza viruses every year. Okay, so there has been talk for a long time that what we need is a, a universal influenza vaccine. Um, it needs to be universal not only because we've got H1 to H18 now, we've also um, got different strains and slightly different subtypes. I mean, H1N1 one year will be pandemic, but we could get a pandemic H1N1 again, just depending on the resortment of the virus. So this here just nicely shows a selection of different targets that people are thinking about at the moment. But you'll notice, really, the ones that are very conserved, the ones we kind of want to go for, again, going back to um, Dr. Katie Dawes' talk, um, these aren't measured using the hemagglutination assay. So what does it tell us? We've got a new target, we need new tools, and guess what? That's where pseudotypes come in. <laughs> Um, so, what is a pseudotype virus? Have you guys heard of pseudotype viruses before? No? Okay. So, what we do is, we take, in this case, the inside of an HIV virus, and HIV is very tolerant on its envelope to, of having lots of different genes. That's why it's so good at mutating, um, as Dr. Dawson was speaking about this morning. So, what it will do is, it will tolerate us, giving it, like, a whole new envelope. So, it's like giving it a new coat. And that means that we can use whatever glycoproteins we put on the outside 
we can explore what's going on with these glycoproteins. And because of the way that the virus is slightly different, because it's not an influenza virus, the spacing between the spikes is slightly different. So it means that we can explore things like access to the stem part of the HA um, much more easily. And as this has become a quite popular target, and there's quite a lot of papers about this now, um, that seems like a good idea. But we can also look at neuraminidase, the NA part of the virus. Now, already, we use neuraminidase as a target for antivirals. If you have influenza, you'll get things like Tamiflu. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, that targets neuraminidase activity, so you're stopping the virus from being able to come out of the cell, therefore limiting the infection in the person who's already infected. But actually, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that if you've been exposed to a particular um, NA once, you will have some protection from it again. The same way as if you've seen the same HA, you'll have protection from it again in the future. Maybe not to um, the extent you would like, but it can be there. So our viruses are actually quite stable. So when influenza is passed through um, cell lines or through eggs, um, it often acquires different mutations because it's a live virus and it's going to change ever so slightly. So you're going to get slight changes. Whereas what we can do is we can actually put in mutations that we want um, and we can change and put new strains in. So if there's a new strain for this year, we can work out the sequence and then we can make plasmids and we can create these viruses. It can also be loss of flies, which is important because it means it can then be sent abroad to places that don't have cold chain storage and they'd still be able to do assays. So this has been tried in our group of people before with Ebola. So they've sent the um, Ebola pseudotype virus out and they've been able to run assays to see how effective the virus was in situ. And also, just to point out, there are many applications and if I have time at the end, I'll tell you one of my favourite ones I heard someone use pseudotypes on. Okay, so it's a really easy process. So we can do something called transfection, which is basically where we take cells and we make them into factories. So we're going to make them produce the viruses we want, essentially. So how do we do this? We give it the different plasmids that we've created um, to be able to wear. So we start off with, if I take the one that's got both, because we can present both HA and NA on the same virus. So we'll have the HA and NA plasmids, you can see. When we have what we call our gag pole core, which is the internal part of HIV, I don't know how much HIV biology you might have done, um, and then we have what we call our reporter gene. So this is what is going to tell us if it's entered the cell. Now we can use GFP, and we can look under a microscope, and we can confirm that our virus has entered that cell. Or this can be luciferase, so it's going to produce an enzyme, which then will we give a substrate, and then we see light, which effectively we measure. Um, and we also include sometimes a protease because these are present in mammalian systems and this is what helps the virus to be able to leave the cell. Um, so we have to give it a little bit of help sometimes. So we make three different types. So we show the HA on the surface on its own, particularly useful if you're looking at monoclonal antibodies and you want to target something like stem. We have uh, neuraminidase only antibodies, uh, sorry, viruses, which we can use to look at the action um, of the enzyme or the ability of the virus to release um, from cells, or we can do both, which represents a little bit more of the system in real life. So we went crazy and we made from H1 to H18, um, and we did I, uh, the influenza B viruses as well. We did before they split into these two lineages. Um, and what we showed here is that we could use all of these and they show it, they definitely enter the cell and they produce light. Now, one thing I said to you before, I was kind of ignoring the bat influenza a little bit. We found we couldn't have just bat HA on its own. And there's a reason for this. This is because the function of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase in bats influenza is completely different and they use different receptors so they target MHC molecules instead. So you can produce them, but they have to be together. So we use it primarily to do a neutralization assay, or as we term it, a student micro new assay. So we have our serum, or this could be antibodies as well, which we dilute. Then we add the, the virus. This is where your neutralization will happen. While they're sat at 37 degrees, viruses are going to stick to, um, antibodies stick to virus. If they're going to stick, if not, they won't. We then add our cells because you need the cells to become infected. Um, and then we wait for two days. 
and then we read and we measure the amount of light that's produced. So in this way, we can look at is utilisation. So we're very lucky. We have um, different organisations that produce um, polychromosome for us in different animals. So we have places like NIBSC and OYE. Um, NOBSC monitors human health and comes up with standards that, um, and they also report back to WHO for influenza, the cases we have in the country, and they're part of the MHRA. And we also, um, OYE is kind of the animal equivalent that's based at APHA and they look at surveying the different animals around us, so they'll be able to tell you how many birds have had H11 or uh, whatever else you're interested in. Okay, so we managed to show this for all of our different strains. And here I've included the bat just because it's cool. Um, so, we wanted to know could we then put this into real world practice and look at a vaccination model? So, we vaccinated mice with the same antigen as our um, strains of, of pseudovirus. And what we saw was that we could measure over time different neutralizing responses, much as you were showing this morning. And when we look at something called the IC50, which is the inhibition. Um, 50, so the dilution of the antibody we would need, or the serum we would need, see 50% reduction in the amount of virus or luciferase produced in this case. And what we see is that it goes up over time, which means that it can be more dilute, and therefore the um, vaccination is working in increasing responses. Um, we also had a look at what we call cross-neutralising responses. So remember I told you within a strain, so within H1, there are lots of different strains. And these have very slight differences, or they can have quite big differences when you look on the phylogenetic tree. Um, so what we can see here is that we get some cross-reactivity with the antigen we've used here across different H1s. You get less here where we've used an H5, um, which has been earmarked as another potential um, pandemic virus. Um, and here with H7, you can see we, they neutralise all of the strains that we happen to have. Obviously our library can continue to grow. Um, so this is a phylogenetic tree just showing you the different NA that we have. So although NA changes at a slightly slower rate, as you can see, they are distinctly different from each other um, and therefore it's worth having um, some of these in your library so that you can think about either teaming them together or looking at them individually. So we wanted to know, okay, we've made these viruses, we know that they're there but can these release the virus, which is what essentially neuraminidase is supposed to do. So we looked at the release um, and we looked at how much light was produced and as you can see the majority of our, of our NAPVs managed to release the virus, therefore they're doing their job. So we then needed an assay of course to put this in. Traditionally responses um, to neuraminidase are measured because of the um, because of the drugs that we use, the antivirus. So what we see here is we basically, on a plate, carry out the um, reaction catalyzed by our neuraminidase, which in our case, the source is going to be our pseudovirus, um, which produces lactose, which will bind to a lectin, and then we, get, um, we, have a, we have this conjugated to HRP, and then we can measure the color change. So, yay, it worked. Um, so what I've shown here is N1 and N2 and influenza B because these are the ones that we have anti um, we have anti serum for. We have anti serum because they're present in humans a lot. So um, we check these with the anti serum; they will work nicely. Drop it down. Um, we then look to some more broadly neutralising antibodies, um, and this antibody here, CR9144, targets the stem of influenza of the HA. So why on earth? Would it produce a neutralizing or inhibiting response when we're looking at the action of neuraminidase? Well, it turns out, so we can only produce these viruses with an HA. We use an H11 because it is the least reactive of all of the hemagglutinins out there. And what we found was that it bound to the stem of the HA and then using just steric inhibition prevented the neuraminidase from doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and then, of course, we had to try it against all of our subtypes. So we have M1 to N9, and then the VMIC and BN. The next step at the moment that we're working on is, can we use this to look at FC effector functions? So, one half of the antibody binds to the virus. You get these two lovely FC portions sticking up, if it's an IgG. Um, these two things, they interact with the system. 
Now, I've been interested for a while in NK cells, and in my last postdoc, I was actually focusing on the NK cells themselves. So, if an antibody is stuck onto your target cell, so this would be your infected cell, um, the um, C16 of the, of the NK cell will interact, which starts a, a pathway, which leads to um, cytokine release, such as interferon gamma and TNF alpha, but also degranulation, which we usually measure using CD107A as a, as a surrogate. So we want to know, how can we use our pseudotypes in the system to look at the quality of the antibody you're producing? Can the antibodies that we've made, for example, in response to a vaccine that could be infection, actually um, tell us about what the antibody's doing after that? So this is what we've based it on. So it's a commercially available kit where you have an antibody coated target cell, um, you add your um, serum or and then you have cells that produce luciferase for you that's already encoded in them. So what we're planning to do is, to using the same transfection method, we're just going to transitly transfect some um, cells so that they present in the appropriate form the um, HA or maybe even NA. Um, and then we're going to add our antibodies or our serum and we're going to see if we're able to measure if there has been any blocking there. Okay, so... Hopefully, I've told you, that antibodies have many functions, not just neutralisation. Um, if we're going to look at novel targets, no matter what the virus is, we need to have novel tools, so we need to be out there developing them. Um, and we think quite strongly, obviously, that pseudoviruses can form a big part of this. Um, and I said if I had time, I'd quickly tell you about one of my favourite examples of the pseudoviruses. So this is now been published, so I can say. Um, during the pandemic, there was a lot of worry that when people were um, performing surgeries, either the surgeons themselves or the person on the table could um, cause infection to the other person. So, one group looked at creating a wand that you could put over the area of surgery um, and that this would use electrostatic interactions to um, remove the virus from the field. Now, they couldn't use coronavirus because obviously it's highly infectious to test it. So instead they used our pseudoviruses um, which is really cool, and they showed we can aerosolize them and they can use them in this wand. Um, and that's been published. I wish I put the reference on now, but you can look it up. <laughs> um, so, it just to raise me really to say thank you to everybody that I've worked with on this project, um, and especially to um, Professor Nigel Templeton, who's been an excellent mentor to me for quite a few years now, um, and Joanne, who is my wife. Um, <laughs> Also, I just want to put an advert up for someone else that can. So you may not be over 18, but if you know someone who is, we're, um, PhD student is doing a survey at the moment about long COVID, which was spoken about earlier. So if any of you want to um, provide this to someone over 18 and they can go on the QR code, I can also give you that information later. Thank you very much for your attention. We've got a bit of time for questions again, so we're going to start the next session with five minutes. Okay. So, for any questions, if you do have five, five minutes, let's open any of those. Yeah? In terms of recurrence of influenza strains that have the same um, hemo. Uh, yeah, HA and <laughs> NA uh, types, is that a case of convergent? Evolution. There is a beautiful paper that talks about clock that eventually they'll come round and we'll get certain changes and it will lead to a pandemic within different strains. So interestingly, the um, 2009 swine flu had very similar HA and NA to the 1918 flu. So it's definitely something people are investigating a lot. People are looking at the black oscillation patterns of the proteins as well. But it's quite quite a cool area, so it's worth researching. Yeah. Um, do you think that after COVID nineteen, there's a lot more like acceleration in trying to figure out, um, or like research into this topic and like seeing how uh, preventative measures could take place to try and reduce the number of pandemics or epidemics that would be in the future? Good question. Um, Maybe it's accelerated a bit, but I mean, HIV was a pandemic, and there was such a massive thrust behind that. You know, like I did my PhD like 30 something years after that, and I was still looking at HIV because we haven't solved it. 
and all of the technology that's been gathered from things like HIV research and influenza research, because this has also been looked at for a long time, we've had a vaccine for a long time, all of that machinery is there in place. And as um, Dr. Dawes said earlier, the fact that we had SARS-1 and we had MERS as well, people have started to gather information. Yes, I agree, now it's probably, um, people are now doing projects where they're going, let's bring these data together. Let's think about what's common between different viruses. Let's think about what um, we have already in place that we can convert into making more vaccine if it comes along or that we can know which target to go for faster. Thank you very much.